the hump is a very beautiful place to fly. Mountains with the sun, snow on it, and deep valleys and over Burma. In the early days, it was just like a adventure, something you like to do. They called it the hump. People were getting killed, the weather was bad, this bad. They're frightening stories that would come forth. They called it the aluminum trail because on your way east there, against the morning sunlight, you could see the glitter of aluminum as we headed into the sun. These are from the aircraft that crashed on the hump. I was born in Paisan, west of Macau. My father took me to the United States in 1924 when I was nine. My uncle was in Shanghai and he said that Pan America had bought over 45% of Sinai and they made one of the high people there. In 1936, when I was checked out, I was not 23 years old yet. I was born in India. I raised there till I was 14 and came to America. So I joined Pan American and I wound up in West Africa. I heard about CNAC. So one time I went to Calcutta to sign up and that's how I joined CNAC, the 1st of December of 1942. In uh, 1940, I inquired at the Canadian Air Force recruitment station, but they said they do not train any Orientals as pilots. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go down to the States, Los Angeles, learn how to fly. I wrote to Pan American Airways and China National wrote me right back. They said, come immediately, we can use you. So that's how I wound up in China in 1944. I was with the Pan American uh, Airways system and then this opportunity for great adventure in the, in the Orient came up and uh, we went to China and arrived there in December of 1943. And it turned out to me that these group of about 20 odd pilots were really the nucleus of our CNAC operation to start with. They came in there and before long they were flying the hump. Burma was falling and they want to find a new route. And then the place we, four countries, India, China, Pakistan, and Russia. CNAC was already doing it when the U.S. Army said it was impossible for it to be done. Though we were civilians, we came under the umbrella of the China Burma India Theater of War, and all our cargo was military by the CBI and our gasoline or our aeroplanes by the CBI. My first flight across the hump with a load of passengers and we're going to Chongqing. I didn't heard of it but never knew where it was. I fly the scheduled flight, you know, carrying passengers from Calcutta, Xinjiang, Kunming and Chongqing. Usually I, I got the charter flight. When I first arrived in India in 1944, the monsoons were on. And I said, how does a person breathe here? The sky was overcast and I had a hard time breathing. Hot and muggy. I saw a little thing like a postage stamp. And I said, Captain, is, is that the airport? He said, that's it. And I said, oh my God. And he went in there and landed this thing on the cobblestones, San Hupa. Airport, the island in the middle of the Yangtze River. But the letdown into Chongqing was a hair raising experience, and I wonder what I was doing. And I never realized that in time I'd make more than a hundred landings into that little airport. And when the Pearl Harbor came, he didn't have any airplane. Anyway, what plane they have, they have no one to fly it. And then use a CNAC plane. Well, he's very nice to me because he didn't have any other other pilot except myself. So we had a lot of chance that I, I never dreamed of going to. The president, he wanted to go up west with the CN and up to Lake Coconut, which is over 10,000 feet elevation. And he wanted to see that lake. The captains were Americans, usually. Some, there were a lot of them of Chinese descent because they owed it something to their heritage that they were 
they go back and defend the country. Quite a few of them were pilots for CNAC, and excellent pilots. And, uh, but they were all from China heritage, but educated and trained in America. I don't think at one time there was more than a dozen Chinese uh, captains alive. We had a few co-pilots. They could speak anywhere from four to seven different languages, in which no matter where we go, we'd have something interpreting it. In the beginning, they didn't think much of a Chinese pilot, but during the war, did you see more and more Chinese. Then you had a lot of VIP from Washington come to Chuck, and then they found out that the Chinese pilot ferried them around before they were only America. I was the first flight over the western part of the home, and they found that the U.S. Air Force couldn't do it, and we did it, you see, so, so they got more confident in, in the Chinese. I left Calcutta at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I landed there, and they said, you're to fly with your brother. So uh, he said, you fly. I said, D why don't you fly first? Because I said, I've never flown a big plane like this. I've done three landings, and in the middle of the night, and I said, how can you tell where you are? He said, oh, wait another thought. And about 20 minutes, Phew! And I said, what was that? Oh, that's the uh, range of mountain over the Salween River there. We always get a downdraft on the east side of the mountain, the wind blowing over the hill there, you get a downdraft. So that tells us where we are. I said, where are we? He said, oh, we should see a lake pretty soon. That's Dali. There was a natural enemy because no place in the world does is the meteorological conditions so adverse to flying. The Tibetan cold air coming in on top of it caused a tremendous turbulence round and round and the highest updrafts in the world. It was unheard of. What I told the people back in Canada that we flew through thunderhead, rainstorm, hail, ice, did instrument takeoff. We talked each other onto the runway. It was an unarmed airplane, so therefore we had no way to shoot back, but we had to be very careful and fly low you know, to avoid the Japanese fighters. But another sure way was to fly at night that time because the Japanese had no night fighters. About 1,500 transports that crashed on the hump, and that was the same rate as the fighters and the bombers. So flying transports was a dangerous thing. And China National was the only aircraft only airline that flew the same route as the fighters and the bombers. So this DC two and a half airplane was flying up around near Chengdu and, and uh, Chongqing. So when he landed there, people just got out of the aircraft and hid in the bamboo grove when the Japanese bombers came by and strafed and bombed this machine. One bomb landed on the right wing and blew it right off. So. An airplane those days were worth more than its weight in gold. It used some shortcuts, so many of the parts of DC-2, although smaller, could be transferred over this DC-3 wing. Well, that's the first DC-2.5 that they did. Four of us were coming back from Kunming. One guy said, I know it's sort of like a shortcut. <laughs> you don't have to go over 10,000 feet. He said, if you follow me, I know this route. So we were on our way. We were coming up on the Salween River. I could see Hayes' problems up ahead, but I decided to go down the mountain. And I saw his left wing hit the trees, and he's gone. Every few months, uh, we can look forward to a few parts being lost. You, wondered why, you know. But after you've been there for a while, you knew why. It could be your turn next. When two little bomb Japan, they took off from the aircraft carrier, landed in the dark, and uh, Dulu landed south of uh, Hangzhou, and then he went to Chongqing. I picked him up and took him to Michigan in Burma, and Burma was falling. I did not know. We saw all the refugees were going away from the airfield towards town, 
Then when they, they heard our airplane, then they all rushed back to the airfield. And they would try to get on the plane, and we couldn't do anything to keep them away from the plane. And then we had a total of over 75 people on for a 21 passenger plane. And then Jimmy Dillow would ask me, say, do, do you know what you are doing? Uh, he didn't say, do, what, he said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I said, oh, they don't waver much. Yunnan Yi, we turned north uh, to uh, go up to the Yangtze River. And there along the road, the, the people were so poor that uh, their clothes were threadbare. So it's quite a shock to me to hit these conditions out over the Himalayas in there. <laughs> I think CNAC deserves a lot of credit, uh, regardless of what people might think about being civilians or mercenary or anything else. They did a one terrific job. We were there when we were needed the most. Before, nobody was interested, but I don't know how come all of a sudden that this uh, last uh, five, six year people interest what happened 65 years ago. I think um, most people coming back from the wars, it was nothing to glamorize. And uh, they wanted to protect their children from the horrors and the bestiality of the war. For this generation, despite that um, most of us in Asia or in China are aware that there was a Second World War, but they didn't know what sacrifice uh, a lot of the people has to make in order to uh, create peace for our generation. And I feel that the Han pilots and their endeavor epitomize that particular effort. And when you tell us there's a band of, of flyers over there, that like no other in the world, it's just like science fiction rather than honest to goodness fact. We didn't know they had to fly in such difficult, unheard of conditions, eh? So that is why all of us in our old age, we try to present this to the people so that they know that it was no joke. At the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondent Club, we have an e event that we try to let the story be told to a larger uh, group of uh, journalists. And I was caught by surprise at how great the response has been that the whole evening was sold out. In CNAC, did you have any procedures at all for the loss of an engine? Were there any options for you? The main decision was to try and dump the cargo. But I swore I'd never jump out of an airplane unless it was catching a fire. Some of the parachutes, the people, ground staff, were stealing the silk and filling them up with newspapers. I thought it would be a hell of a situation to find myself hurtling through 120 miles an hour from the earth reading the Calcutta News. <laughs> One more. Okay, ready, sir. Welcome back. Thank you. It's a pleasure to see you. He's a Canadian. Canadian, okay. <laughs> Spring chicken. Spring chicken, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yi San. I'm donating this to you. Wow. I think about 10 pictures. Fifty-seven years, his first trip coming back. Well, it was one of the last planes we started evacuating Shanghai. I'm so happy to be here and to meet all you wonderful people. Uh, we have a big program and we'll leave tomorrow and do our thing over in China. Modern Kunming. I love it. Only thing I don't recognize any place. Pete hasn't found his old girlfriend yet. It looks something like the mountain of Gibraltar, but we called it Scarface Mountain.
And we always used to come in, we knew we were right on track to land at the airport here. And this place is closed in and they had to circle a letdown. There was a lot of, lot of stuff left here after World War II. Around you, Nanny. That looks like a Japanese one. That looks like a Japanese airplane to me. Sid was right. He says the mock up airplane. Yeah, decoy. That's the word. I see they save all the rollers. You saw them making the runway? Oh, yeah. What, was, what? what were they doing? How did they do it? Well, they did they use, use their buffalo or use. They use uh, 200 buffalo, the two legged one. Well, two legged ones, okay, so you stay. Men, women, yes, children, all get up there. Holy, holy oh, God. Away. The kids, too. Why not? This has been finished only less than two years. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, 2005. That's local effort. Oh, I go in here? Yeah. All right, okay, watch the step. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'm glad to have this for them to remember. All right, see that? 15, this is 9, 15, yeah, yeah. oh, 7. Yeah. I'd like to come back and relive every place I've been when you get to be 90 years old, you know. It's going to be 20, 2,700 meters and onward, upward. So, so I, if we don't need to evacuate anyone, let's stick to that plan. I'm feeling just fine. Uh, I'll let you know if anything develops. Hang in there. Yeah. We've got to call 7-8-0 first. 7-8-0? 10,000 uh, foot mountain in the Himalayas. The mountain is called Chicken Foot Mountain. Hello? This is your granddaddy talking. I love you. I'm on top of the pagoda. It's good to see all these colors. I remember way back when, when there was nothing but green, gray. How long have you been waiting for this? 65 years. 65 years. <laughs> It wasn't a schedule, as I said, it was just uh, mainly for the radio station and we supply the radio station with the gasoline, whatever they needed. When the animals are on the ground, usually they hear the plane, they just look at it, but you have once or two, you have to buzz it, to chase them away with the sound. Very summer when we flew over here, we ever since saw the Yangtze River. It is awesome. The picture of that mountain back there. Really. Amazing. 
Summertime capital. Set yep. that's, that's where you get your pay. What do you call this anyway? It's a computer. It's a computer? No, we don't call it. It's a computer because it computes what you're going to be doing. Please, let's get this thing on. CNAC was the Middle Kingdom Space Machine Company and the letter they had on the vertical surface near the tailplane uh, was postal, post office. And then underneath the wings they had in broad letters uh, CNAC and also that in Chinese letters Middle Kingdom Space Machine Company. Is this grand be able to see this once? You just got to it takes a while to absorb it all. To reminisce 65 years ago. Here I am, standing, looking at the scenes of our youthful memories. Never have a dream to come in here, I think. I dreamed of it, but I never thought I'd ever make it.